It's my pleasure to welcome you to, the, to this convocation ceremony of the Simon School on behalf of Ed Hagem, the current chairman of the Board of Trustees and the entire Board of Trustees. Uh, difficult times often bring out the best of individuals and of institutions. There's no doubt but that we are in difficult times today and it pleases me no end to report that the university under the visionary leadership of President Joel Seligman and particularly the Simon School under the thoughtful and energetic leadership of Dean Mark Zupan have been receiving increasingly greater and greater recognition. Uh, that is demonstrated by uh, additions to the faculty here and by your presence here. This is an extraordinary class. Uh, I'd like to talk just a couple moments about opportunities and taking advantage of them. You have certainly taken advantage of the opportunity of coming here to the Simon School, you, where you will have the chance to learn under a world-class faculty, to engage with your fellow students who are all truly extraordinary. Uh, my graduate degree was not in business, it was in law. But I will say that in addition to receiving a first-class education from at the hands of my faculty, I learned as much and sometimes even more from the interaction that I had with my fellow classmates. The curriculum of this school provides you those opportunities and I'm sure that you will take full advantage of them and also of the opportunity to hook into a dynamic an energetic alumni network that will certainly help you while you are here and after your graduation. Uh, I also suggest that although your faculty may have other plans for you, that you try to maintain some balance in your lives and have some uh, uh, participation in the larger community, the larger community of the university and also of Rochester. Uh, we have in just two weeks a Meliora weekend that I like to describe as an intellectual smorgasbord. And I encourage you all to take a look at some of those offerings and break away from your studies, perhaps to uh, uh, attend one or more of them. And of course, we've got the Eastman School of Music and, and uh, in the Rochester area, uh, many artistic uh, uh, activities and your Finger Lakes region. So balance is, is, uh, uh, is important and I recommend that to you. Uh, it is now my personal pleasure to introduce to you the provost of the university uh, this is a person who holds both an MD and a PhD degree, has achieved national and international recognition for his medical research, and has now turned his talents to academic leadership uh, within the, at the University of Rochester. We are very fortunate uh, that uh, he is here. He has just received extraordinary recognition by being appointed by the National Academy of Sciences to the Governmental University Industry Research Roundtable. That's a mouthful, but uh, if you think about it, that is at the intersection of much of what uh, will represent the future of this country. Uh, please uh, Welcome to the podium, our provost, Ralph Kunzel. Thank you, Bob. 
Uh, good afternoon. I want to add my welcome to all of you uh, to the Simon Graduate School of Business at the University of Rochester. You are about to embark on the Simon Experience, a unique opportunity to learn about yourself while enjoying the very best in business education. You can't do better than that. Now, as I read that scripted sentence about embarking on an experience at Simon, I hope to uh, address not only the new students who are the majority of the convocation audience today, but also those of us who have been associated with the school for a long, long time, dedicating ourselves to a new experience in a new year. And perhaps I even will enlarge the audience to that charming infant in the back with the red and white skirt. Uh, perhaps she is an early learner. Uh, and uh, she and her generation will be amongst those who follow you as new students. When I came to Rochester several years ago, I was already aware of the exceptional research that the University of Rochester is noted for. But the Simon School especially has created a body of research that informs business studies throughout the world. The Simon School's faculty are international leaders in cutting edge research and theory that changes the way the world does business. This past year, the Financial Times of London rated the Simon School second in the world for finance and fifth in the world for managerial economics. We have historic strength in accounting. We are a rising star in pricing. But our professors are not citizens of the ivory tower. This year, Simon faculty have been reaching out pro bono to instruct the public on the recent financial crisis we've all experienced in a lengthy list of panel discussions in Rochester and around the nation for alumni and the general public, also in opinion pieces in the press and in media interviews. And they will work with you directly in the classroom. In your studies here, I challenge you all to learn as much as you humanly can about business from those who wrote the textbooks on every topic and from your teammates as well. I'd like to wish you the very best in your studies here at the University of Rochester Simon Graduate School of Business. Now it's now my pleasure to introduce Dean Mark Zupan. Mark joined the Simon School in 2004 after having served as Dean of the Eller College of Business and Public Administration at the University of Arizona. Mark is a Dean of great energy, huge commitment, high integrity, and an absolutely unsurpassed work ethic. Under his leadership, the Simon School has advanced by virtually every relevant measure. It has been very rewarding for me to learn that my most positive view of Mark's contributions are matched by the students, the faculty, and the alumni of the school. Since becoming dean, Mark has fostered a greater entrepreneurial spirit at Simon that has successfully differentiated the school among its competitors. Enrollment is at an all-time high with increases especially in the full-time MBA and specialized master's programs, and the quality remains strong. Fundraising has increased for the annual fund by over five-fold, resulting in new major gifts. Through these major gifts, the school has established new endowed professorships, which have attracted exceptional scholars to the school. New programs, curricular enhancements, and partnerships with leading business schools in Korea and Chile have been added, reinforcing Simon's outstanding reputation around the world. All of this would not have been possible without Mark's vision, hard work, and leadership. And on a personal level, I am deeply inspired by Mark as a dean and as a man. I want you all to welcome him today to the podium. Dean Zupan. Thank you, Ralph, for the kind introduction. Um, uh, welcome, everybody, to this year's convocation. Uh, half the time uh, in a role such as a dean of a business school like Simon, you, you spend externally. Uh, 
a meeting with successful alums of an institution. And you get to do some hypothesis testing along the way uh, because uh, there's commonality across the alums that you meet with. Uh, they all have the same exceptional education. Uh, they all uh, came to the school uh, with exceptional talent. And we've screened for that to the latest batch of students. Uh, we're delighted you're with us. A lot of careful thought and attention went to your applications. Uh, so those are uh, very much uh, necessary conditions uh, to seeing the end outcomes that then we get to with great pride experience and interact with. Uh, but there, were, uh, there have been a couple striking things on some recent trips. Uh, about two weeks ago, we took a swing through uh, Dallas, L.A., and San Francisco. And there were three striking features um, of this trip of the alums we met with. And they, they speak to some of the sufficient uh, conditions for success. Uh, number one and two, great openness to diversity. Um, whether it was intellectual or whether it was geographic diversity, uh, we're the most internationally diverse business school among the top tier when you look at full-time enrollment. Uh, roughly half of our student body hails from a country outside of the United States. We've also also been open historically to age diversity, and that's become a little more pronounced in recent years with our Early Leaders Initiative. So it was striking how this diversity not just made the educational environment richer, uh, but that uh, talent, uh, wherever it came from, and what it was able to do with the education, whether it was running into a Chinese entrepreneur in uh, Dallas that had gone from zero dollars in sales to this year, uh, three years later, uh, $30 million in sales. Or an Indian uh, who had come to us uh, with a lot of experience and uh, had ended up going to work in New York City and then the Houston area and then ended up uh, with a major position in portfolio uh, management in Dallas. Or somebody who came to us straight out of a college in Sri Lanka and now runs a $13, $13 billion hedge fund out of Los Angeles. Or somebody who joined us from Palestine uh, who's been CEO since he graduated in the early 90s and now of two major healthcare firms and is proceeding with a roll-up strategy in his uh, unique space that he operates in. Or a younger alum with uh, an Israeli background uh, that uh, came to us from uh, undergraduate school at SMU and is succeeding in the finance world in Dallas. So it was just striking to see such the wide diversity that gets mirrored in our current student body, whether it was age or international diversity. But then the other characteristic that really uh, is the most defining aspect of uh, the success these alums have achieved, and I would argue it's over half the battle. Uh, education will get you far, uh, talent will get you far, but at best that's half the battle. At the least, half of it is the attitudes and values uh, you bring to the equation. Uh, you encounter a lot of adversity, uh, in different forms, professional, personal. The way you're able to identify uh, your unique selling proposition, what you stand for, and what you work for through that, adver that adversity, in the end defines who you are and allows you to achieve great levels of success. And let me just mention a few of these examples because they were striking. Um, this uh, Chinese alum who had had quite a lot of experience as an engineer in China. Uh, had worked, had to work all his way through Simon to pay the bills, and had worked at IT Google Pumps, uh, got a major offer at Corning, and uh, helped Corning uh, during a, an appreciable rise, but then realized uh, he really wanted to become an entrepreneur, and that's where his passion was. And described to us how um, he and a friend went through 15 different ideas, uh, and of the 15, only one ended up working. And in the craziest of places, uh, whiteboards, uh, the things you'll see in our classroom, uh, what he found is it's a billion dollar a year market. And in the United States, um, there was no um, production of whiteboards outside the United States. 
So by his background, especially in engineering and manufacturing in China, he found that, look, you could sell these things for $140 a pop on average, and the cost to produce and distribute them from a major factory in Shanghai, $70. So in the space of three years, um, the venture has grown now to $30 million a year, and every ambition of growing it to $150 million five years from now. And then what he's really excited about is he thinks he has a model to beat out Amazon uh, through his experience in China, and that's his next big dream now that he's realized, I really like being an entrepreneur. And he went through quite a bit of challenges to get to the point, not just the 14 failures as products, uh, but some of the uh, commitments he thought he had along the way that he had to learn how to, when they didn't come through, uh, still keep charging ahead. The Indian alum in Dallas, uh, came to us uh, with a fair bit of experience. And he ended up working for a major Australian and New Zealand company uh, due to visa issues. That was the easiest way to get into the U.S. market. Uh, that ended up being dramatically downsized. He didn't expect it to be. Uh, then ended up working for this company in Houston by the name of Enron. And that went through its own challenges. Uh, but along the way discovered what he really likes to do is analytic-based uh, portfolio management and the Simon degree equipped him exceptionally well for success. Uh, now he's a major player uh, with a very significant firm in the Dallas area. Through those challenges, he found what he's really passionate about. And then the third one, we uh, met with uh, a 74 alum. Uh, he graduated in some incredibly tough times, uh, similar to now. Uh, he ended up uh, going to cobbling together different work assignments coming out. He'd come to us as an early leader uh, from another upstate school in New York and also discovered he had the entrepreneurial bug. Uh, ten years out, roughly over half our alums end up becoming entrepreneurs and started the first uh, software publishing house when he lived in L.A. Uh, later on was one of the co-founders of MySpace. And if anything is picking up momentum, uh, last April in one week, this guy took four different companies public uh, in one week. And every time we go back, uh, he's got more ventures brewing. Uh, this last time we were around, we heard about a, uh, an algae firm out in Nebraska that uh, is both good at producing biomass and good at purifying water uh, when water's been used in the energy extraction business. One of his other late ventures, uh, ADEX, uh, has figured out how do you make money in advertising in new media uh, that he's grown for zero, from zero million three years ago now to 30 million this year. And one of his clients is uh, University of Phoenix that he told us, look, uh, they spend over a million dollars a day on advertising. We've figured out a model whereby we don't get paid until the agreed upon results uh, get delivered to our client firm because he said the adage in advertising historically, you know $10 million of your advertising budget works. Uh, you just don't know which five million or which uh, half of that uh, uh, and where it ends up working. This is a much more accurate way to measure something like University of Phoenix can say, if you can get somebody on the phone for at least 60 seconds, uh, it's worth $600 to us. And so finding clients that can scale up and you can show results by different channels or by tweaking the message is found to be a very profitable growth opportunity. And the biggest advice that spoke through their examples is how do you channel adversity uh, to create the success that they're now realizing. Similar stories are waiting to be written out in the audience and for the faculty and staff to convey to you the great pride we have in you joining our institution, uh, whether it was last year or this year. It's a wonderful portfolio for us to hold uh, because we know there are future Fortune 500 CEOs, entrepreneurs, uh, heads of major nonprofit organizations, CFOs of places like the New York Times uh, sitting in the audience today. And it's a wonderful thing as a faculty and staff member to be associated with that talent. We're delighted you're here. Uh, we wish you well on that journey, and we look forward to working with you both currently as students, continuing to work with you as a second year, and then beyond as alums. And next, let me introduce Ricardo Medeiros, 
who is our GBC president, to also offer his remarks of welcome. Thank you all. And before I offer my comments, I'd like to invite Dean Zupan to continue our tradition of signing a copy of the Simon Credo to start off our year. Thank you, Dean Zupan. And of course, um, everyone is invited to sign the credo as a sign of uh, acceptance and of truly believing in what the credo stands for. And of course, I remember very clearly sitting in a strong auditorium last year where we held convocation, and uh, then afterwards signing the credo myself with my colleagues. At the time, the uh, impact was not uh, as heavy as it has grown to be over time. We were told many things about this credo, but the most important of them to me uh, was that, and I quote, these guiding principles give students an understanding of what we expect from one another. Let me read that again, because that's important to me. These guiding principles give students an understanding of what we expect from one another. And of course, this room is filled with some of the most intelligent, driven, successful people I have ever met, both in the faculty and in the students. Uh, we're all here in the spirit, very, very spirit of Meliora, and that is why our mutual expectations are truly powerful. Uh, groundbreaking faculty, top-notch administration, and an amazing support structure, which we all enjoy, uh, can take us quite far, but not quite all the way. Uh, by always expecting more from each other, we can provide the support now and as alumni uh, that makes the Simon experience very powerful. Of course, expectations are only half the battle. Uh, Dean Zupan had the half the battle somewhere else, but that's my battle. Um, and we owe it to each other to effectively communicate constructive feedback at all times and in all aspects of our lives, both here at Simon and away. We're all amazing, and with such support, we can become even more amazing. So with that said, the Simon Credo is not something to simply glance over, see at orientation, or even to sign once as we uh, leave this convocation. Every time we think about the Simon Credo, we should be reminded of the truly powerful message that it represents and the wonderful family that we all belong to now. Once again, from the GBC, I'd like to welcome everyone to Simon. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. We would next like to introduce our keynote speaker, Gino Santini. Um, he has, he embodies the characteristics uh, mentioned that also saw on this recent trip out west. Uh, I was skeptical when Jerry Zimmerman first came up with the idea of early leaders, of being open to bright, motivated people who came to us earlier in their careers. Uh, Gino was one of the individuals that convinced me that uh, Jerry Zimmerman was on to a great idea. Gino came to us straight out of college, uh, the oldest uh, university in the world, the University of Bologna, also from overseas. Uh, we're very international today, and we've always been very open to international students, and he's a living embodiment of that. After coming here uh, and having his first year of education, his internship was with Eli Lilly. Uh, he found that what he'd learned in the first year allowed him to succeed to a very significant extent. And he also found he loved the culture and the opportunity that Eli Lilly provided. So he's a wonderful testament of what uh, talent, uh, what assignment education, and then what attitudes and values that a person brings to the equation can ultimately accomplish. We're delighted to have Gino back on campus today to offer some remarks to the current students. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction, Dean Zupan. Here I stand 20, 26 years after receiving my MBA from Simon, and it is really a great honor for me being part of this convocation ceremony. And actually, it's an honor that I hardly deserve, since uh, I have by no means given back to the school 
all the good that the school has done for me. So when Dean Zupan asked me, I, I thought this would be a great opportunity to get started. So why did I initially decided to come to Simon? Actually, back then, it was called as the University of Rochester Graduate Business School. It was actually partly coincidence and random luck, but for the most part, it was good old customer service on the part of the school. As an undergraduate, I was a, an engineering student at the University of Bologna, and while I liked what I was doing, I was really interested in pursuing a business education in the United States. However, I had never been to the US, and I did not know any better. And of course, at the time, there was no internet, no Google, no Wikipedia, so to help me to find out where I should go. So I went to the American consulate in Rome, and they had an office with books on the walls about all the universities in the US, and a staffer gave me a list of names of schools that were the good ones, where I should apply. So that was my research. Well, I took the list, I applied to several of the schools that were suggested to me, and Rochester was the first one to respond, to accept me, and also provide substantive information about housing, about financial aid programs. This was more useful than the school probably even knew, especially to an Italian college student facing the daunting task of moving overseas to pursue an education. So I was sold, and I never looked back. So how was my experience at the U of R Business School? It was excellent. It was also kind of cold, and that was uh, something that they have left off the brochure, but, uh, but from the beginning, I really felt intellectually stretched and challenged. I really loved the quantitative, as an engineer, the quantitative approach to business and economics. I loved the coziness of the school, and I loved the close interaction with the faculty. Later, I really came to appreciate how well it prepared me for my professional career. We also did business cases, those business cases of that school in Cambridge, the, the Cambridge near Boston. Now, all kidding aside, I enjoyed those because they reinforced to me that I'd made the right decision to choose Simon. You know, we had good prep work with your team and then a vigorous two-hour discussion in class using many of the analytical tools that we had learned. But the last 10 minutes, usually the professor would pull out the Harvard discussion guide for that case, and we would laugh together over his lack of quantitative integrity. So I really liked it. <laughs> Needless to say, Simon prepared me to hit the ground running when I joined the company, my company. Actually, the accounting that I studied with Professor Zimmerman proved crucial for me when, in fact, my first assignment was to develop and install the cost accounting system of the division that I was working in, and it was smack on. I employed the financial modeling I learned from Professor Smith, who is here, to develop great business cases for the investment project that I managed. Actually, when I went back to Italy, I was seen as an IT wizard at the time, and, and mine was the first personal computer that was ever bought by Eli Lilly in Europe, and I had to get the approval from the chairman back in Indianapolis. But, but lastly, who could forget Professor Jensen, who I understand still comes here to, as a visiting professor. He, he had his RAM model, Rational Evaluative Maximizing Man. Now I think it's RAM, Rational Evaluative Maximizing Person, much more politically correct. But he made an indelible mark in my way of thinking about human being and organizations. And he has been crucial to my ability to align and motivate teams throughout my career. So the school has had a humongous impact on, on me. Now, throughout my career, I worked with many colleagues and actually many subordinates too, from Harvard, Stanford, Wharton, and Columbia. Not once I have felt that the education at Simon was at a disadvantage. In fact, quite the opposite. And I've done a lot during my career, and it's been a wild ride, a lot of fun and great experiences, both professionally and personally, but all within the one company that offered career and stability. I started in 1883 as a financial analyst, and 12 jobs and 26 years later, I'm still at Eli Lilly, my company, after stints in Italy, US, Belgium, Mexico, back to the US, and in many diverse roles, including finance, market research, 
sales, general manager, regional manager, business unit manager, then public policy, strategy, business development that I'm doing now. Now, the path and experiences within my company have certainly been varied and challenging, but the framework was inherently different from that that you might face today. The different challenges and new experiences on the job were all framed by support from a consistent, ethical, and employee-centric company that was established in its business. And in fact, I remember that for many years, and I've done a lot of recruiting in business schools, and I've talked to many, many students, and, and we used for a long time to look for talent that were the right fit. We were looking for potential rather than experience. We were not hiring for a position, but for a career. And uh, often, we made offers even without telling students what their job would be. They just needed to trust us, and they could trust us. And I certainly have no regrets, and I really love the company I work for because it's truly like family to me. Now, it's fair to acknowledge that times are changing, and picking a company for which uh, you intend to retire is probably less of a reality than it used to be in the past. In fact, for, for many students, for many, that, for many new hires that join companies, the concept of a lifelong career in the classical paternal way is increasingly becoming a thing of the past. Uh, more and more large firms are actually adapting to this new world, and they are eliminating some of those entitlements or the you know, defined benefit plan that are probably a thing of the past. Now, the short-term driver is certainly the affordability, and the need to be cost competitive with younger firms which do not have the huge legacy entitlement costs. But in reality, today's business environment requires a totally different knowledge, uh, relationship between companies and employees, which is, again, different from the one of the Kodak, the Xerox, the General Motors, the Merrill Lynch, the IBMs, or the Lilio, the Mercs of the time when, uh, when I joined them. So it is an increasingly heterogeneous, challenging, but also exciting world out there. Now, I'm certainly not trying to paint a dark cloud on the changes, particularly at your convocation. Actually, quite the contrary. But what I'm saying is that now, more than ever, there is no one more important than you in determining your future path. Does it mean that an experience in a large company is not worth it anymore? Absolutely not. Large companies are still an incredible source of experience, opportunity to create value, and an excellent place where to have a career. But now, even with all those companies, they need a different set of value, skills, and motivation from their leadership and from their employees. So as you start your academic program at Simon, what are a few pieces of advice given my experience since I've left the school? Now, first and foremost, use your time here to get a good understanding of the concept of business ethics and integrity. Now, just the recent economic and financial turmoil has confirmed that staying within the boundaries of the law and the regulation is not enough to avoid preventable catastrophe. Moral and intellectual integrity and understanding and following the spirit and not just the letter of the laws is absolutely necessary quality for any future leader. And the standards are changing every day and they have changed dramatically in the last few years. Second advice is develop a good understanding of the concept of risk and, and assess your tolerance for risk. When you will finish school, you will need to decide if you want to be an entrepreneur on your own or, small, or work in a small startup or a small company or work in a large and stable organization. It used to be that working in a large and stable organization was less risky than the other alternatives. I am not that sure about, I'm not that sure about it anymore. Now third, the technical prowess that comes with a Simon MBA will always serve you very well. Continue to hone, broaden, and advance those skills. Accounting, operation, finance, marketing, IT, whatever you decide, these and other technical disciplines have always been the Simon's forte and with very good reasons. But, but I recommend that you complement that strength with a stretch beyond your comfort zone. Let yourself be exposed to a broad set of experiences. Try something you never thought you would see yourself doing. 
And my last piece of advice, and that goes very well aligned with some of the uh, examples that uh, Dean Zuman just uh, mentioned. Lastly, use this time to really understand what your passions are. Learn as much as you can, but, when you need to, but then you need to follow your heart. Don't pick a job or an activity just because the conventional wisdom or someone that you trust tells you that it will be good for your future. The times when I did the best in my career were when I really had a passion for what I was doing. And I still have goosebumps when I think about or I talk about those times. So you will be successful when you do what gives you goosebumps. And life is short. So I, I saw recently that uh, the speech of Steve Jobs where he says, stay hungry, stay foolish, is right. And try to have fun as you do that. So this is what I actually recommend my children now that they're looking at uh, what to do in life. And this is what I, I recommend to you, really. Follow your heart and your passions. With that in mind, enjoy and embrace your time here at Simon. Uh, you have just signed on for some of the most memorable and challenging times of your life. Uh, I know from my own experience that you will be very well prepared by Simon. And, and frankly, the fact that you picked Simon as your business school is already a great sign that are on your good path for success. So best wishes on your studies this year. Thank you. Thank you, Gino, for being with us today and uh, for that advice and remarks from the heart. Please join us immediately following the ceremony. There's a reception in the Eisenberg Rotunda. Uh, we request that you remain in your places until the platform party is left. I would also encourage you to join us, uh, Ricardo and myself, in signing uh, the credo. It's a voluntary decision, but it speaks, and it was student-developed several years ago. It speaks to the values we hold dear, uh, chief among these being integrity.